Welcome back to another episode of 40 Facts About the 40K Universe. I am your host, Gersh One, and you are watching One Mind Syndicate. Today, we continue the Horus Heresy series. This is part seven, so if you have not checked out the other videos, please jump on over to our YouTube channel and check the previous videos. But this is going to be part seven, Sanguinius's Betrayal. The Ultramarine's battle barge, Armsmen, intercepted the Conquer and came abeam, launching assault carriers and boarding torpedoes. While the World Eater's flagship was busy repelling boarders, a number of smaller 13th Legion vessels slipped past her defenses and launched drop pods, gunships, and troop carriers. The first Ultramarines poured into the Conqueror. These Legionnaires wore cracked armor, still scarred, burned washed from some horrendous battle weeks or months before. They were hardened veterans of the Kalth atrocity. They burned with cold intensity to carry out vengeance in their heart. The Ultramarines established footholds at defensible positions, clearing room for their reinforcement to land. But it wasn't an easy fight. The World Eaters were uncontrolled, unbound, unrestrained. They butchered their way through the Ultramarine strong points, enslaved to the joy of battle because of the Butcher's Nails. Word bearer units marched droning black hymns and chanting sermons from the Book of Lorgar, bearing corpse-stewed icons on befouled metal and bleached bone above their regiments. Amidst the clamor of war, Gilliman confronted Lorgar. The ultramarine Primarch possessed the advantage of two weapons, but Lorgar's Crozius gave him a reach that his brother lacked. Both Primarchs fought without calling their warriors, their godlike movement an unconceivable blur to the Space Marines killing each other around them. In his righteous anger, the Ultramarine Primarch struck Lorgar with one of his fists, battering the word bearer's Primarch sternum. Lorgar hammered his Crozius into the side of Gilliman's head with the force of a cannonball. Both Primarchs faced each other beneath the gray sky, one bleeding internally and the other with half of his face bloody. Angron bursted forth from the Ultramarine's ranks. The World Eater launched himself at Gilliman with a murderous hatred. The true Primarchs fell into a seamless, roaring duel where Lorgar and Gilliman had abandoned theirs. Gilliman found himself forced back by the storm of Angron's blows. Angron charged Gilliman. The warp boiled behind the veil. Lorgar started to chant in a language never before spoken by any living being. His words in flauntless harmony with Angron's cry of torment. He was trying to summon the ruinous storm to the world of Nuxeria calling for the newborn, the entities men called demons, to answer his call. Lorgar's plan quickly changed as he locked Angron's muscles, setting fire to the synapses in his brain. Angron was being turned into a demon. Nineteen World Eater librarians sensed the power summoned by Lorgar and attempted to halt his dark plan. They manifested the psychic entity known as the Communion. In the midst of Lorgar's incantation, the Communion pulled the soul of the Primarch from his body. The two psychic entities confronted one another within the warp. Locked in a deadly contest of wills, each convinced that they were the ones responsible for saving Angron. Ultimately, the Communion failed, for Lorgar was just as powerful in the warp as he was in the material universe. After Angron's completed metamorphosis into a new demon prince, the demon prince turned his attention to the librarians, killing every single one. The gravely wounded Gilliman escaped from Nuceria, unable to face or even fully comprehend what both of their brothers had become through their corruption by the ruinous power. The World Eaters completed their purge of Nuceria until not one human life remained on the world. Angron, now the very embodiment of the Blood God. The Shadow Crusade could move on from Ultramar and rejoin Horus. Lorgar's mission, for the most part, was a success. The next target for the traitors would be Terra itself. Horus and Sanguinius, the Primarch of the Blood Angels Legion, had fought many campaigns by each other's side. 
Their relationship was so close, it had even created jealousy amongst the brother Primarchs on occasion. Horus knew that Sanguinius would never willingly betray his father, and so he formulated an audacious plan to either convert the Blood Angels Legion to his cause or utterly destroy them. Horus discovered decades earlier a carefully guarded secret of the Blood Angels when he fought alongside Sanguinius in a campaign on the world of Melikor. Horus witnessed Sanguinius murdering one of his own Astartes because of a genetic flaw called the Red Thirst. The Red Thirst is a Blood Angel's constant thirst for blood. To learn more about this genetic flaw, please check out the 40 Facts video on the Blood Angels. Sanguinius had been aware of the flaw in his genome for several years, keeping the truth from the Emperor and his fellow Primarchs. Of the Blood Angels, only Ascalion, First Captain Raldoran, and the Master Apothecary on the Legion homeworld of Beliand were fully aware of the extent of the genetic mutation. Horus vowed to help Sanguinius deal with his secret and not tell the Emperor or any other Primarch. Before the Isfen atrocity, Horus ordered Sanguinius to gather his entire legion and make for the Cygnus Cluster, a triple star system located in the Ultima Segmentum near the Eastern Fringe. His legion was to cleanse the seven worlds and fifteen moons that comprised the Cygnus Cluster of Xenos invaders and release the humans settled there from their Xeno overlords in what would later be known as the Cygnus Campaign. The War Master informed Sanguinius that he had found the means by which the Blood Angels would be able to get rid of their genetic flaw. The Blood Angels had to follow Horus's command, and he would free them of their secret. The Cygnus Cluster had fallen prey to Agents of Chaos and became a home world to the Realm of Chaos, a system of hellish demon worlds under the rule of a greater demon of Slanesh, known as Kyrus the Perverse. When the Blood Angels arrived in system, their fleet was ambushed by the malevolent force of the Warp, crippling or killing many of their navigators and astropaths in an initial onslaught. The Blood Angels now faced the fury of chaos for the first time. Kyrus sent an image of himself to Sanguinius, declaring his lordship over the system in the name of Slanesh, and taunting the Primarch into taking it back from him. Rising to the challenge, the Blood Angels Legion attacked the demon hosts of Kyrus, launching a series of attacks on the world of Cygnus Prime. During the epic battle, Sanguinius came face to face with a new nightmare known as Kabandha, a greater demon of corn. During the battle that ensued, Sanguinius was sorely wounded and temporarily incapacitated. He witnessed the demon slaughter 500 of his sons with a huge swath of his mighty axe. The psychic backlash of the death of so many of his sons blasted Sanguinius into unconsciousness. With the fall of their Primarch and the slaughtering of their brethren, the Blood Angels Legion was consumed by a black rage that drove them into a berserker fury as they charged into the demonic hordes and in their madness smashed the hordes of demons into pieces. The demon unleashed a rage within the Space Marines that ultimately destroyed him and even the mighty Kyrus was banished back to the Immaterium. Only when the planet was cleansed did the rage of the Blood Angels finally subside. Though Cygnus was freed from the forces of chaos, the cost of victory was far higher than any could have wished. A new curse called the Black Rage would afflict the Blood Angels and their successors. Before the outbreak of the Horus Heresy, Perturabo, Primarch of the Iron Warriors Legion, had become bitter over the fact that his legion had often been used for siege duties and resulted in little glory or recognition. While on a campaign to cleanse the herd warrens on the world of Gungan, the Primarch received news that his own homeworld, Olympia, had risen up in rebellion against the Imperium. The Olympian Demagos had brought the people together and risen in arms against the rule of the Emperor of Mankind. 
Perturabo and his legion returned to his homeworld and brutally purged Olympia of its rebels, city by city overrunning the fortresses he had built and sparing no one who stood against him. By the time the massacre was over, five million Olympians had been killed and the rest put into vicious slavery to the Iron Warriors. After the world was cleansed, the Primarch Perturabo realized that the Iron Warriors were no longer the saviors of the Imperium. They had been destroying the alien herd one moment, and yet in the next, they were committing genocide against their own people. Nothing the Lord of Iron could ever do from that moment on could ever atone for the worldwide genocide. Horus forgave Perturabo for his sin, unlike his father, who would never excuse such a horrible deed. Horus had sworn Perturabo never to feel guilty over what he had done in Olympia. He joined Horus's side. After the Dropsite Massacre, the Iron Warriors took the time to humble their great rivals, the Imperial Fists, on the planet of Hydra Cordatus. The Iron Warriors bombarded the planet's lone formidable fortress known as the Cadmian Citadel. Magnum bombs and mass drivers boiled away the rivers and reduced the planet to an arid dust bowl. The Cadmian Citadel was left untouched and the small garrison of Imperial Fists that Rogaldorn had left behind still found it difficult to believe that such a precise bombardment was possible. But the Iron Warriors had purposefully done this in order to show the Imperial Fist that they were superior to them in every way. The technological cunning of the ancient fortress builders married to the artful Roth geography and the courage of the defenders proceeded to keep the Iron Warriors at bay for at least three months. When the Iron Warriors finally overcame the Citadel's ancient defenses and broke open its walls, they ran amok. They slaughtered the remaining Imperial Fists, the heroic men and women of Hydra Cordatus, and the refugees from the devastated fields below the fortress. 52 Imperial Fists, 13,000 men, women, and children that were crammed into the citadel's walls. When the final assault came, the Lord of Iron himself spearheaded the audacious attack upon the citadel's defenders and slaughtered over 30 Imperial Fists in a span of only a few minutes. The surviving mortal refugees were enslaved by the Iron Warriors, and before they moved to their next objective, Hydra Cordatus was reduced to a barren desert world. And those were 40 facts about the Horus Heresy. We learned a little bit about what happened to Gilliman, we learned about Sanguinius's betrayal, and we learned a little bit about the Iron Warriors and their destruction of the Imperial Fist's world. Now, be sure to click on part two to catch more on this series. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. We put out Warhammer 40k lore videos every single week. Please share and comment. It really helps us out a lot. By doing that, you're allowing us to create more videos for you guys. Hopefully, the goal is to produce a lore video every day. And we're, we're getting actually pretty close. So thank you guys so much for liking, commenting, and sharing this video. This was Gersh1 with One Mind Syndicate, signing out.